Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm glad to see everybody this morning and I uh, hope you are, uh, are doing well. Your spirit is doing well. And, and I hope that this time together is uplifting to you as we spend the next hour or so in the presence of each other and in the presence of the Lord. I forgot to announce this last week because um, it is still a little fresh. It's old and new at the same time. Uh, we have... We're not, no longer signing in at the back, uh, so we are doing the red welcome folders again. Uh, so one side of the pews, I don't know which one, um, should have a, your, the old red welcome folder. It's probably a distant memory at this point, but uh, maybe you remember it. And sign in your name and, and uh, check off that you're here. And, and I'll say the old joke that I used to say, and we'll give you credit uh, that you are here. And it'll go to your permanent record, and we'll all be good. And if you can do that and pass it along in the pews, and then uh, we'll grab it at the end. And, and if you want to rip it out for us so that we don't have to do that, we appreciate that too. For other, other announcements, today uh, is the last day I'm going to take requests or suggestions for our August sermon series. Uh, I have some ideas that, are, that have, people have given to me, but if you have any that you would like to hear, whether uh, topics or scriptures that you would like us like to, hear, to hear a sermon about, um, if you could write it on paper. Um, some people have told me verbally and then I've almost forgotten which, what, what they said. Uh, so if you could write that down or email it to me, uh, that would be great. And then I'll try to compile that this week so that by the time you get August's newsletter, you can see what people are asking about and what we're going to talk about. Uh, Vacation Bible School starts in just over a week. We're ha having it at Lord of Love Lutheran Church just down the street. Uh, registration forms are out on the tables or they're on our website online. Uh, if you have a, a child, grandchild, great-grandchild who would like to participate. Uh, we are still in need of volunteers. Uh, so if you want to talk to Susie, if you have some free time this e these e evening of uh, the week of the 26th to the 30th, we would appreciate the help. August 1st, uh, we're going to have a lemonade stand. So get, your, get ready to be thirsty and, and uh, in, in the mood for lemonade because the, our, our youth will have a lemonade stand on the August 1st after worship. And all the proceeds will be combined with the VBS mission money uh, to go to Holy Cross Lutheran Church and their food pantry. Also, uh, most of you, I'm assuming all of you got your ballots and letter about the parking lot repairs in the mail. Uh, we have a lot, we've already received a lot of ballots back, uh, but if you have not returned yours yet, if you would like to vote, the, the box is in the back table of the sanctuary, uh, just drop it off and We'll count it in your vote. Or if you don't have it today, you know, we'll be here all week um, in the office and you can just drop it off sometime or mail it. It's up to you. There's multiple ways. Isn't that great? Uh, multiple ways to do it. However you would like to do it. Congregational way. That's the way we do things. Multiple ways and however you would like to do it. Are there any other announcements for the good of the fellowship? If there are none, would you please rise as you are able and let us greet one another in the peace and love of Christ. I keep forgetting to ask, do you want to combine it? Yeah, yeah. So just announce it all yeah. together? Okay, okay. I'll remember one of these times to ask beforehand. All right, let us begin our worship this morning with our musical call to worship and leading right into our opening song of prayer, Majesty and Great is the Lord.
please be seated. Let us join together in our unison prayer printed in the bulletin or on the screen. Let us pray. O oh God, our rock, our refuge, our resting place, out of another busy week of work, out of our struggles to be meaningful in our world, out of our desire to meet and know you, we come to you. May your spirit move among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Very beautiful. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the letter of the Apostle James. We're reading, we're kind of skipping around a little bit within the letter. We're starting in chapter 1, reading verses 5 and 6. Then we'll jump around, jump to chapter 4, specifically verse 3. And then we'll end in chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. Uh, if you're following along in the Pew Bible, it starts on page 854. So first we'll start in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt 
Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. And now jumping to chapter 4, verse 3. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And ending in chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other, each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful. And effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When I was just but a wee little lad, I enjoyed tagging along with my mom whenever she went to Norfolk. Now, I don't know, I, 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 maybe this was just a Stanton thing, but it was a big, big deal to us kids who lived in Stanton to go to Norfolk. Norfolk was the place to be. Of course, now it's like, really? That's what we thought, but whatever. <laughs> Well, whenever mom would go to Norfolk, I would always, and, I could, and I got to tag along, I would always ask if we could stop at McDonald's to get something to eat. Well, initially, my mom would usually say, no, we don't need to stop at McDonald's because we have food at home, which was a wise thing she, she, she said. But I would keep asking and keep asking and keep asking, until my mom would give in and we'd get, make our way to the nearest McDonald's. There were two in Norfolk. That was a big thing. Two. Which one are we going to? <laughs> I've noticed as I've grown older that uh, children are not shy about making requests of their parents. Can I have McDonald's? Can I have a snack? Can I play outside? Can we go home yet? Can I play on your phone? That's a little bit of a new one, but still there. I'm not a parent myself, but I see that it's tough being a parent in those situations, or even a grandparent. You are entrusted with knowing what's best for your child, yet you also want to see them happy. Sometimes you do give them what they want, like a trip to McDonald's. And usually they're quite happy when you fulfill their desire. Other times, you have to say no. And that no leads to tears and screams and tantrums. While your child is having a tantrum, you, you are required to stay strong and not give in because you know that what they requested is not what they really need. Well, that's the theme of today's song, Unanswered Prayers by Garth Brooks. And I'm really hoping, I checked earlier, but hopefully this time it actually works for us. So George, play it. Just the other night at a hometown football game My wife and I ran into my old high school flame and as I introduced them, the past came back to me And I couldn't help but think of the way things used to be She was the one that I'd wanted for all times And each night I'd spend praying that God would make her mine 
And if you'd only grant me this wish I wished back then, I'd never ask for anything again. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Remember when you're talking to the man upstairs. And just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Because some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered. Third prayer. I thought it would be good to, of course, include a country western song. Uh, try to catch as many uh, genres as we could. Uh, it seems the song Unanswered Prayers is one of Garth Brooks' most popular songs. Obviously, he's a very popular country musician, um, but this is one that I think really speaks uh, a good theological message that we can, we can expand, upon, expand upon today. Released on October 12th of 1990, so just short of my birthday, <laughs> Uh, the song follows uh, a man and his wife who attend a football game in their hometown. And while at that game, they run into the man's high school sweetheart. And as he introduces his wife to his ex-girlfriend, he reminisces about he and his ex-girlfriend's past relationship and how he had once prayed so fervently that this woman standing in front of him would have been his wife forever. That was the first verse. If we, go to the, if we had listened to the second verse, he, he realizes that during their conversation, he sees how he and his ex-girlfriend have changed over the years, how the ending of their relationship led to him meeting his wife, and ultimately his conclusion that God, not answering his prayer, was truly a blessing. What I find interesting, and I guess it's not that uncommon or unrealistic, is that Garth Brooks has stated that this song is actually based on a true story, a true event, that he had run into an, his ex-girlfriend, and he made this song about it. And Brooks has stated that every time he sings this song, it teaches him the same lesson. Happiness isn't getting what you want. It is wanting what you've got. Well, over the time that I've been here as your pastor at Northwest Hills Church, I've, I've talked a lot about prayer, about the importance of praying to God, both in the good times and in the not-so-good times. I guess I probably wouldn't be much of a pastor if I didn't talk about prayer. I have often encouraged us to follow the teaching of the Apostle John when he wrote in his first letter this, Quote, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have what we have asked of him. We can be confident that when we go to God in prayer, he hears us and he listens to us. We can be confident that God will give us what we need if only we ask. Ask and it will be given to you, said Jesus. Matthew 7, 7. That is the promise of God. But I think we tend to overlook that little bitty phrase that says, if we ask anything according to his, that is, God's will, he hears us. According to God's will. I think that's a very important part of this. I think that also echoes what James wrote in his verses from his letter, which we read just a few moments ago, specifically chapter four, verse three. When you ask... You do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. 
both John and James are making me pause and reflect a little bit and thinking about my own prayers. Specifically that prayer that I've admittedly prayed uh, a few too many times. That prayer of me either winning the lottery or coming into a vast amount of wealth. When I've prayed that prayer, I often negotiate with God that if God just gives me this wealth, well then, I could feed the hungry, I could help the poor, I could help the church, etc., etc. The list goes on. And then I say, yeah, I'd probably maybe take a nice vacation. I'd probably buy myself a nice fancy car. I'd probably make sure my suits are always custom made and tailored to be fitting. Hmm. After some reflection, I'm starting to think or starting to realize why God has not answered this particular prayer. Actually, I don't think God has not uh, has not answered the prayer i think god has given me a resounding no <laughs> it appears that me having a vast amount of wealth is not according to god's will but then that begs the question well what is the will of god and how can we pray according to it well this is, gets me a little bit nerdish, I guess, and I enjoy it. When the will of God is discussed in theological circles and among pastors and theologians, I'll try to break it down to you the best way that I can that hopefully you can understand. It's often broken down into two categories. The first category we'll call God's mysterious will. This aspect of God's will is mysterious because it refers to how God has created the universe and as the creator is sovereign over the universe and that we are mere creatures of the creation and that we do not completely understand how everything in God's universe works. It reminds me of the story of Job. Job endured much suffering and hardship in his life. And he cried out and called upon God to explain to him, to come before him and explain to him why he was suffering so much. And he talks with his friends, and that's a whole other issue of what they said. But uh, at the end of the book of Job, God does show up before him. And And God gives an answer. And the answer is essentially that Job is but, a, is but a finite creature. And God is the creator and ruler of the universe. And because of those two positions, Job cannot possibly understand the complexities of ruling the universe that God does. That's God's answer. Kind of underwhelming. But I guess true, that there are things and situations in this world and in our lives that we simply cannot fathom why they occur. However, God does not leave us completely in the dark. The second aspect of God's will is often called God's revealed will. Throughout time, God has revealed knowledge about himself and his ways a little bit at a time. God was known by Adam and Eve and their children. God was known by Noah. God was known by and even befriended Abraham as well as his descendants. And it was to Abraham's descendants that God revealed his revealed will, what is right and what is true as well as the kind of life that God asks his people to strive for. God revealed his will through Moses at Mount Sinai, through the words and messages of the prophets, and ultimately through his son, Jesus. 
And then the words of Jesus have been passed on through the la- by, throughout the last two millennia by the apostles and the church. There's, there's more definition to it. There's you know, more uh, specifics to it. But the revealed will of God has often been boiled down to, as Jesus said, two important commandments. That is of loving God and loving others. Now, Really, these commandments seem rather simple, and really they are, but we often don't like to follow them as best as we should. And and so it takes wisdom and it takes help to discern how best to live out God's will in any particular circumstance. But God does not leave us high and dry. God helps us and has given us wise counsel in a a variety of ways, from the words of Scripture, from the people of God around us, as well as from the guiding presence of the Holy Spirit. And so with the revealed will of God in mind, what is outlined in the law and the prophets and in the words of Jesus and the Gospels, the next time that each of us pray, perhaps we should reflect upon the content of our prayers. What are we praying for? Maybe more importantly, why are we praying for those specific prayers? Are we asking for things because we want them for our own self gain? Or are we praying for things that help us become closer to God, that help us become more Christ-like, that help us advance the kingdom of God in the world. I think we must remember that God is not a magical genie that we can call upon, rub his lamp, and, and then he grants every one of our wishes and desires. God is the creator. And as the creator, God is the ruler of the universe. And because of those two things, God has a bigger picture in mind for the universe as well as for us. Revealed in the gospels and the prophets and the law, God desires to see us continually transform into the likeness of his son, living a life that is good, righteous, living out those two commandments of loving God and loving others. And that may mean that some of the things that we want, we won't receive because they won't help us become more Christ-like. Perhaps, yeah, I could use millions of dollars to help the helpless. Or, and it seems likely that this is what God is telling me, that I should be content with what I have, what God has given me, and then use what I have the best way that I can. So again, I challenge us to think about our prayers. And and the next time we're praying, to think about what and why you're praying. Do the prayers and desires that you have align with what is aligned with God's will as you know it? Is what we're praying for help me love God or love others better? Because if they don't, perhaps it would be wise to ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance in figuring out what God's will for us is in our unique circumstances and then ask for the Spirit's help in reflecting that in our prayers. Bless you. (laughs) There is one kind of prayer that I would like to focus upon for these last few minutes. I don't know because I am not God, but I imagine that many of the prayers prayed to God revolve around the words that sound like, God, please heal me from X, Y, or Z. At the core of my faith, 
I do believe that God can and does heal people of their illnesses and pain. There have been numerous people with awe-filled testimonies of God's amazing power that has healed them. And it's wonderful to hear. And I praise God for them. Jesus, throughout his ministry, performed miraculous healings that glorified God and deepened the faith of those he healed. And so I believe that if the Holy Spirit moves us to pray for healing, that we should do so, whether it's for ourselves or for our neighbors, unceasingly. However, while I do believe that God can heal anyone, I also believe that we must never presume that God must heal us. Just as there are examples of people being healed by Jesus in the Gospels, there are also examples in Scripture when God does not immediately relieve someone of their suffering. But rather, God engages it I often think of Joseph and how he was sold by his brothers because of their hatred of him. How he was locked away for years in an Egyptian prison on false accusations. Yet he told his brothers years later that what they intended for evil, quote, God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. Well, I don't fully comprehend all of Joseph's story and and what God was doing in there. Joseph has said that if it wasn't for Joseph going through those particular things, it would not have led him to the position he was in, and therefore it would not have allowed him to help the Egyptians and others in a time of drought. And famine. The Apostle Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthian church about a thorn that was given into his flesh. Now we really don't know exactly the affliction that Paul suffered from. There are theories and, and speculations about that. Perhaps it was a mental illness or a physical illness or a spiritual problem. But either way, he suffered greatly. And that's the main point. And Paul wrote in his letter that he pleaded three times with the Lord to take the affliction away. But the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So God responded to Paul's prayer, but not uh, Paul's prayer for healing, not by curing him, but rather by working through Paul's suffering. Paul's weakness, Paul's ailment, whatever it was, was to be an example that all the great things that Paul did were, were not because of Paul alone, but because of God's great power and grace. And Paul's lesson, I think, can be applied to us. We can either allow our pain and suffering to cause us to fall deeper and deeper into anger and despair at God and at others. Or our pain and suffering can allow us to to cling to Christ. To know that we, yes, we are weak, but he is strong. Despite our weaknesses, God can accomplish much through us. Yes, even our suffering. I'll give you another example, the prime example. Think of our Lord Jesus. It was through his pain, his suffering, and his death that we receive God's overflowing and never-ending grace. Like last week, I talked about learning patience through difficult circumstances. Some of the best ways we can learn is through experiences. 
Well, perhaps we can use the suffering that each of us endures, whatever it may be, to, allow, to bring us closer to God. The one who tells us that his grace is sufficient. The one who loves us and holds us and cares for us and helps us get through it. And the good news of the gospel is that the suffering and pain that we endure in this life is only temporary. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it, does it? It seems like it goes on forever, but our lives on this earth are truly but a blink of an eye, especially in the lens of eternity. While suffering, pain, and death seem rather dark, the good news is that Christ's resurrection has made it all but fleeting. Christ has made death a mere breath before the eternal glory to come, where there is no pain, where there is no suffering, where there is no tears. And so I encourage us in our prayers, in our, our daily lives, in our actions, in our thoughts, to, to hold on to that hope, that promise of God, that our pain and our suffering, even our death, is not the end. all because Christ has promised that light and life is yet to come. Prayer is a wonderful and good thing, and I believe that prayer can change the world. But as Garth Brooks sang, sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers, or I think a better way to put it, God sometimes says no to our prayers. But that does not mean the end of the world. Sometimes God's gift to us is to tell us no, or not yet. We trust in the will of God. We trust that God knows what he's doing, and that God is leading us to him in all that we go through, whether it's joy or sorrow, happiness or pain. It's all to lead us to God. Therefore, I hope our prayers reflect this wonderful truth. Let us pray. Our loving and heavenly Father, You know each of us better than we know ourselves. You know our fears and our desires. You know how much we want something. You know how much it will devastate us if we don't get it. We also know that you love us. We know that you have a plan for us. Please, O God, don't let our desires and our wants blind us to your perfect will. If we ask for something that is not within your plan for us, may your spirit speak to us and inform us of of your answer. Give us the knowledge and wisdom to know your will and the strength to follow it. Give us peace about whatever is to come. May we trust you and know that we are always, always in your hands. Oh God, at this midpoint of the summer season, we are so thankful for the wonders of life that you have created and have given us to enjoy. We thank you for the delicious bounty of summer the produce of gardens and farms. We thank you, O God, for the crispness of corn on the cob, the juiciness of vine-ripened tomatoes, the joy of ice-cold watermelon, the fragrance and flavor of fruits like apples and pears. You have given us such pleasurable provisions, a treat for all of our senses. 
I ask that you help us remember the people who have worked long hours in the hot sun to tend the crops that we are so happy to, to consume. We pray for those who labor to bring the crops to market for our benefit. I ask that, the, that you bless the home gardener as well as the farmer with a sense of sharing with you in the work of caring for creation. We also thank you, O oh God, for summer's invitation to celebrate life with family and friends. We are thankful for the days spent beside and in cooling pools and lakes. We thank you for the opportunities to laugh and play on vacations and in fun activities. We are also mindful of those who cannot get away this summer. May they feel the loving presence through phone calls and letters, as well as through the loving presence of your spirit. God, we continue to lift in prayer those affected by last weekend's storm. We are so thankful for the crews who worked night and day to restore power to our homes and businesses. We are also thankful for the police and firemen and emergency workers who rushed to help those in need. We are also thankful for the neighbors who helped clean up our yards and moved away the debris. May you bless them as we have been blessed. We also lift in prayer the people who are on our hearts and minds and the prayers which only you know. We pray these prayers, Father, trusting that you hear us. We pray that they are according to your will and that you answer us in your perfect way. May we have confidence in your answers. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time for the, in thanksgiving for all the gifts and offerings that God has blessed us with and that you have returned to the work, of the church, work and ministry of the church, would you please rise as you are able and let us sing the doxology. Almighty God, we offer you these gifts in humility, signs of your goodness and your faithfulness. May you receive them with our gratitude that through us, the people of Omaha and beyond may know the riches of your love. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let us join together in our hymn, Help Us Accept Each Other.
as you go forth from this place, may God be in your head and in your understanding. God be in your eyes and in your looking. God be in your mouth and in your speaking. God be in your heart and in your thinking. May you go in the peace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.